Next is uh, Mr. Pugh. You're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Bilirakis, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for considering my testimony and for the invitation to speak at the hearing. Uh, let me begin by thanking the subcommittee and the members of the entire Energy and Commerce Committee for the time dedicated to developing comprehensive federal data privacy and security legislation last Congress. We focus on finding consensus on a comprehensive federal data privacy and security law in the United States. One key aspect of our ongoing work is the intersection of privacy and security, including how national security and data security should be key drivers in passing a federal law. Data privacy and security are vital to both consumers and industry. However, such a law is vital to national security. This often underappreciated aspect is the focus of my testimony. Given the topic of today's hearing, I will focus my analysis on China. In 2020, the China Task Force found that the Communist Chinese Party has a record of using official government resources and companies with CCP affiliations to compromise the data of people around the world, and that the United States and its allies need to join the effort to secure data from the CCP surveillance state and other malign entities. These co concerns are especially prevalent in China itself, where advanced technology is used to track and monitor their citizens with few if any protections. I wish I could say that the concerns raised in 2020 are no longer valid. In fact, it's the opposite. They're worse. Data can reveal everything from your shopping habits to sensitive parts of your life, like your health and location. This in the hands of the adversary or malicious actor can have devastating consequences, especially for vulnerable populations. As one recent example in the Russia-Ukraine war, data can even be amassed to target disinformation campaigns or direct even physical violence toward those in conflict. This is certainly not an isolated capability and something that the United States should worry about. It goes without saying that the United States' rivalry with China has taken on a digital nature. And China has been in a race with us in terms of technology for years, from artificial intelligence to military-specific technology. There are ways to help mitigate and reduce these concerns, even though China's collection and abuse of data will likely never end. A national data privacy and security law, much like the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, also known as ADPA, last Congress, is the most logical next step. I will explore three main benefits and how it could address the data collection crisis, but my written comments expand on them. First, acting on privacy legislation makes America more competitive. Countries around the world have acted. Even China has privacy laws. Unfortunately, those are more likely to be disingenuous attempts by the Chinese government to appear concerned about privacy and security than genuine efforts to promote privacy. This is especially true given the continued surveillance abuses in China and the lack of security for even Chinese citizens' data. Nevertheless, the United States still lacks a comprehensive privacy law and is, look, and is becoming an outlier, especially as a country that leads in trade and is looked to as a norm setter. This has led to companies both American and global adopting other frameworks as the default. The lack of a privacy law also does not obligate most foreign companies to follow specific privacy or security rules while operating in the United States. Congress has the opportunity to change this by enacting a law and clearly conveying the United States' position. Second, many aspects of ADPA would help mitigate data privacy and security threats. For example, ADPA contained data minimization principles, which means data should only be collected to the extent it is necessary or proportionate to provide a product or service. In addition to the value this adds to Americans individually in terms of privacy, it helps reduce the amount of data collected and available in the first place. Other beneficial provisions include a requirement for privacy policies to alert individuals that their data is transferred to select countries like China, and establishing strong data security standards. Preemption is also a beneficial aspect because it creates one standard, which will allow for threats from adversaries and bad actors to be dealt with consistently. Third, data privacy and security legislation has broader impacts. TikTok has continued to raise concerns on a bipartisan basis. Several options exist to address TikTok. But regardless of the path chosen, it's only a partial solution. First, TikTok is just one application from one country. Not only are there risks from other adversarial countries, there are also other current and future applications that will pose risks. Second, many software and hardware products that pose risks, like connected devices. While a federal data privacy and security law might not be the full solution to those concerns, it would serve as a way to help reduce what information can be collected, who it is shared with, require security, and provide for enforcement should be violated. Failing to act on federal legislation would ignore the broader risks posed by data and leave threats from China and other malicious actors unmitigated. The United States may lag behind other countries by not having a federal data privacy and security law, 
but the 118th Congress has the opportunity to chart a path forward. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Pugh, did you want to comment on that, on the minimization issue? Yes, I'd be happy to. So data minimization is one of the key reasons why ADPPA or whatever future bill it may be is essential in national security. We're essentially limiting the data that's available in the first place. Uh, to, as we just started, we don't want to make it too constrained that we don't have the data necessarily for technology, but making sure we only have the data that's necessary and proportionate uh, using the bill's language is so critical, and it helps minimize what could potentially fall in the hands of the Chinese government. Um, uh, Mr. Pugh, your testimony mentioned uh, reports of baby cameras spying on children. Um, and I, I wondered if you would uh, comment on, uh, on that. There right now is no federal law um, that would stop that, um, even China doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, those of us who are parents here and around the, the, the country would be very concerned about protecting that data. Did you want to comment on that? I, I'd be happy to. I think to, to your example, uh, Congresswoman, that is a, a baby camera spying on, on babies is definitely a real possibility. We also see uh, vacuum cleaners mapping out homes. I, I think those are real concerns that we need to address, and it really ties into the benefits of IoT or Internet uh, things, but also some of the risks. Uh, Mr. Pugh, um, at a time when Republicans and Democrats agree that AI is a national security economic imperative, shouldn't we be more cognizant of the amount of data we are making available to our adversaries? And secondly, what steps can we take to prevent U.S. data from being accessed by the CCTV? Well, thank you, Congressman. So uh, data in itself is essential. We need it for our economy. We need it for innovation. To, to your point, the issue is when it falls in the hands of adversary nations and malicious actors, which we see happening on a second-by-second -second basis with China, unfortunately. Uh, and that's something that uh, I really implore this Congress to, to address. And I think the best way to do that is by acting on a comprehensive data privacy and security law today. Um, why it would benefit consumers and industry, the security nexus cannot be under, you know, overstated. And, and what I mean by that is just one aspect. This contains data security provisions. It would require data to be safeguarded. And if, if that actor chose not to follow that, then there could be enforcement as, as a result. Okay. Mr. Pugh, how can we secure our network if the smart devices we rely on are compromised by the design? So, uh, uh, Congressman, you're right. Th this is a critical issue. We rely on IoT devices on a daily basis, and the number of devices by 20, 2030 are supposed to be 29 plus billion. Um, the issue is we don't have a baseline for our IoT devices. So that is a, a great starting point, is seeing is there a baseline that these device manufacturers should be meeting? Secondly, making more of them in America. I have more faith in American companies that do privacy and security enhancing things than I do with a CCP-backed uh, company. Mr. P, first question. I agree with your statements that data privacy and security are vital to consumers and industry. Uh, understanding that the CCP has repeatedly compromised our data uh, and that the ADPPA from the last Congress was a good first step in combating this data gathering, can you please speak to the seriousness of delaying that legislation? Well, thank you, Congressman. That's a, a phenomenal point. And every day we wait, uh, or every second we wait, I should say, is just the more data that Ch the Chinese government, the CCP, is, is collecting and potentially exploiting against Americans. I mean, we see their collection happening in the United States, outside the United States, but still directed at Americans. And then we can't diminish the fact that they continue to just steal and even sometimes buy it. Uh, and that can uh, unfortunately be used to, to target both intelligence uh, professionals, those in the military, children. So I, I think it's just paramount that this is a key priority and is done without delay. Are there specific uh, pro-growth policies you would like to see from America? I think uh, one of the best policies would be first acting on the comprehensive data privacy and security law. And I think one of the benefits of ADPPA was the uh, intent of trying to get at the fact that not all companies are the same, is that we need to take into account that small and medium-sized businesses have different needs and different capabilities than our largest international players. Uh, not to say they, they all may not have privacy risks, but, you know, a mom and pop business on Main Street cannot comply in the same way that, it, or nor have the same risk. I have a question for you, Mr. Pugh. 
Do you, uh, should I worry, should we worry about the partnership with a Chinese uh, automobile company with autonomous vehicles as far as will our data be secure or will the Chinese Communist Party use it? Well, thank you, Congresswoman. I'm, I'm not as familiar with that, the partnership that you referenced, but what I can say at a high level is that when the Chinese government does have involvement with the company, it's something we need to be very careful and mindful of and ensure that they're not collecting data and then ensure it's not going back to the CCP. Uh, and then we also need to ensure what we are collecting is safeguarded and secured. Um, I think those two go hand in hand and you can't have one privacy without security and, and vice versa. Uh, Mr. Pugh, uh, first, I want to thank you for your service, for your work with the Armor, Army Cyber Institute. The Army Cyber Command Center is located in the 12th District of Georgia, my, my district. And it's good to see how expertise can be shared across the public uh, and private sectors for data security purposes. Uh, we're not engaged in cybersecurity warfare here, but how do you see passing a national uh, data privacy framework providing for more cooperation among allied countries against current and political adversaries? How do you see that framework? Well, thank you, Congressman. And uh, th thrilled to see the, uh, the Army represented in Georgia. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time at Fort Benning, so uh, appreciate that. Um, and to, to your point, I think the biggest issue now, Congressman, is we don't have a privacy law here, so it's forcing American companies to follow other frameworks around the, the, the really, like GDPR and the European Union, that's just not as friendly to businesses. So I think this is really a key opportunity for us to develop a framework, and hopefully others follow what we view as the American vision. And I think the critical aspect of it is there are several provisions that promote security. Uh, just to flag one of them is the notice if, if a consumer's data goes to China, North Korea, Iran, and Russia. Right now, data can flow there, and the average consumer is totally unaware of it, uh, and that's just a deep concern. My question goes, the first one to Mr. Pugh, but let me read a little statement. Um, as a mother and a grandmother, I'm deeply concerned about the ways TikTok is manipulating our nation's children, you know. I've seen reports that detail China's version of TikTok, which offers the friendly version with educational videos and learning tools and time limits set on what the children look at in China. And then you come over here and you see the opium version, which, you know, uh, addicts our children in front of their phone. And that educational tool isn't offered over here like it is in China. Um, what are the current data, data privacy protections for our children and how could a comprehensive data security standard help strengthen those protections? Well, Congresswoman, thank you. Uh, our current standards, simply put, are, are inadequate. I mean, we have, we have COPA, uh, there was some other attempts to look at children's privacy legislation, but I think the real answer is a comprehensive approach, not the diminished attempts that are specifically at, directed at children, but really privacy is a concern for all Americans. And I do think that was a, a, really a hallmark of ADPPA last Congress was, regardless of age, there was protections there to help you. Uh, specifically with children, there were several phenomenal ones. Uh, everything from uh, additional resources to FTC directed def uh, specifically at kids, to rules around target advertising for, for kids. Mr. Pugh, you said in your testimony, and my good friend from Tennessee alluded to this, you know, the protections and privacy laws are wholly inadequate, by and large. How do we balance that patchwork of state laws? How can we do a preemptive federal privacy and data security law that specifically uh, allows for those protections while prohibiting the stifling of entrepreneurs or new market entrants into tech-related industries, quantum computing, social media, AI, et cetera. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you. And, and I think you, you really uh, answered the question uh, kind of yourself because uh, <laughs> preemption uh, is, is key. And I think ADPPA was a great substantive step in terms of how preemption was, was solved. And that's exactly the, the thing. We, we need one federal standard, not this patchwork that is emerging. Granted, only five states will have privacy laws in 2023. We've already seen dozens and dozens introduced uh, this year and last year. So I think the real potential of having even more laws this year and next is, is going to be there. And it's gonna, it hurts our small and medium-sized companies because they don't largely have the resources to, to follow all the developments, the constant amendments at a state level, whereas if they have one standard to look to, it may still take resources, but at least it's one standard. So I think that is, that is the key, and making sure preemption is uh, strongly reflecting a federal bill. 
I appreciate that. And, and I'm going to follow up again on my, my good friend from Tennessee. We were sitting over here talking about TikTok. You know, I'm the millennial in the room. And so this is a, a generation grandmother, millennial, but you know, this is a, a concern to me, my peers and the generation coming directly right after me, the Gen Zs. I grew up with social media, MySpace, uh, Facebook, today Meta. Um, these have real world impacts, uh, privacy concerns. Heck, one social media uh, platform can be directly attributed to a political revolution in nations abroad. So we know that there are real world impacts that we have to contend with. So obviously TikTok being a huge one, uh, Representative Harshbarger alluded to the fact that in China on TikTok, children 14 and younger are, are shown patriotic videos, educational videos, um, history videos, and they're limited to 40 minutes. In the United States, they, they have the algorithms set to do shorter videos that are uh, meant to create dopamine hits in your brain. There was a survey done between the United States and China of 14 year olds asking what is the most aspirational career you want to have. In the United States, the number one answer was social media influencer. In China, they said they wanted to be an astronaut. If you want to look at the future of our two nations, start here. That is why we need to be very serious about how we contend with TikTok and other apps like TikTok. So my question, and I know I'm running short on time, is how can we protect our kids, our data, while simultaneously respecting free market economics in these applications? Um, the balance is a really tricky one, but we need to have a game plan moving forward on how we contend with this. And if any other witnesses want to answer this, I'm open to, to hearing your thoughts. Let's, nine uh, seconds. yeah, <laughs> very brief, and then we're going to take the, the question for the record. It's a very important question, so I want, to, I want you to have as much time to answer it. Uh, this is what we're facing in this country. Please, briefly. The, the, the short answer, uh, uh, Congressman and, and Chairman, is passing a national comprehensive data and privacy and security law. We did okay. a report last year with 125 different entities across all ideologies in conjunction with Harvard, and we, we think that really is the answer of solving some of these national security and privacy concerns. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Pugh, I'm going to ask you the same question. You got, I mean, 45 seconds. The follow up's always easy. But I mean, I think we always operationalize this at the national security. But it's hard to get it down to my 15 year old daughter who's on TikTok way more than she should be in all of these different issues about the data collection. I, I think the key point to recognize, Congressman, is, is data is not just universal. There's different types of data. So even when it comes to geolocation data, um, Yes, maybe I'm an exception because I serve in the military, but, out, but outside of that, I don't want another country knowing where I am in a moment, where I'm going, where my movements are. Regardless I don't want my own country knowing that. <laughs> um, so I think that that is a risk. And then off of that, not only do they collect the data, they're really bad at securing it, evidenced by the, the breach they had in the Shanghai Police Department last summer. Um, so they're collecting it, and they, they're not even making it safe. So even other third parties and adversaries are getting it. 